What's up guys, and welcome back to Morcom and back to Transfer Deadline Day. So I did actually make it through to January, but, well, it, I was going to say it wasn't that difficult. It, I've, I've not been... I don't know if it's because I know this is coming to an end, but I've just not been that driven to play FIFA recently. I've just been finding that a bit frustrating, but... Anyway, we made it through to January, and some hefty dealings have been done. De Bruyne, for £73.5 million, has moved to Real Madrid. I don't know how old he is now. I'm going to check. I'm going to see how old he actually is. Alright, so he's he's 30 years old. He is 91 rated, but he won't stay there for long, I don't imagine. Given that my Hazard is about 31 now, and he's already started going down, I reckon De Bruyne by the end of the season will probably have gone down at, well, end of, possibly the end of this season, maybe the end of ne like start of next season, he might go down a point. But even then, he's still 90 rated, and uh, yeah, Real Madrid got themselves a very nice player. Although... I'm not sure he's worth 78.5 million, given that his valuation, according to this, is only 60 million. I think Real Madrid have slightly overpaid. I don't know how much was left on his contract, um, but I think 73.5 million, which I think is what they. Yeah, 73.5 million is a hefty amount of money for him. Lukaku, as well, has moved to Barcelona for 67 million pounds, which. It's about bloody time Man United got rid of one of their strikers. I have played Man United, I don't know how many times, like, in the last two years, three years, I've probably played Man United at least six or seven times. I don't think I've faced them once when Lukaku was in the squad. I've played against uh, Dybala and Griezmann absolutely tons. Like, every time you play, it seems to be one of them who starts up front. I can't remember a single time they've brought Lukaku on. I, I, do, I doubt he's even been on the bench. How he's still at Man United up until this point, given that he was basically like number three or four striker, I don't know. Like I would have been wanting out as as well as the fact that he's probably one of the top like three or four strikers in the world. So why like he's still at Man United after all of this time, given that he was like a third choice striker? I have no idea. But he's finally moved to uh, to Barcelona, so he'll enjoy his time over in Spain, I'd imagine. Um, Lucas, as well, has moved for £26 million to, Bar uh, to Bayern Munich from Real Madrid, which I think I'm right in saying Lucas has only been at Real Madrid for about a season. I don't think he's been there for that long. I think he only moved maybe last summer, or la either last January or the summer, like a season, a season and a half ago. So I'm not sure how long he's been there. And £26 million, I think, is less than Real Madrid paid for him in the first place, but... Well, I suppose. It was a bit of a weird one in the first place. Lucas is he's decent, but I don't think he's like Real Madrid quality. Especially when... I think they got him to replace Ronaldo. And then we took Thomas Lamar from Real Madrid, so I don't know who they've got now. Unless De Bruyne is his replacement, which, I mean, De Bruyne is not exactly a like-for-like a -like replacement for Lucas, but he will do a lot from midfield, so I don't know. I don't know what the deal is, I don't know what this game is thinking about, but yeah, some hefty transfer dealings. We haven't done a lot, to be fair. We have done absolutely nothing. We, we've we had a couple more injury blows, so I have spent in total one and a half million. No, I haven't. I've spent absolutely nothing, and I've made one and a half million from selling uh, Dennis Moraes, who we've had for a long time. He was still progressing, he was still in improving, but... He was never going to become, like, a number one player again. I don't think he's ever going to reach the level of Ndidi or Locatelli. So, actually, how old is Ndidi these days? 25 still, so he's still got a very long time in front of him. Locatelli's only 22. Um, and he's, he's kind of catching Ndidi as well. He's going up quite nicely, and I think he's still got really high potential to get, get much further. Gomez has uh, gone up a few points. He's up to 85 now. Still not, stop, not knocking on the door of... Uh, first name on the team sheet, but he's he's getting that direction, and given that he's got potential to be special, he will eventually get there. I don't think his career mode will go long enough to get him anywhere near the, that far up the field, to be honest. I think he's a, he's a solid off-the-bench player, but I don't think he's going to get any further than that um, before FIFA 18 comes out. Um, Vallejo, very nice to have him on the, uh, on the bench, just to bring off, um, in case, well, like this, Ducksworth's a bit a bit knackered, you can always stick him on. Um, injury blow, Aguirre, 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 Aguirre uh, whoever. 
He's a. Uh, yeah, I think he broke his ankle or did something. And he's out for three months. So, yeah. Luckily, that happened just at the start of the transfer window, so we have signed a replacement. Um, we have kept Kawa, obviously, who can play there. Um, but we have signed. Uh, actually, signed two players. We have a couple of left wings in our squad who came through our youth team who are not too bad. Um, but this guy, uh, Chisano Baia. Ba 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 he, um, yeah, we actually signed him on loan from somewhere. I'm not sure. Can't remember exactly where. I think it was somewhere from Spain. He's very good. 74 rated. Might sign him at the end of the season. Then again, career mode's not going to last much longer than that. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, he's a solid, solid backup. Probably, he's, he's better than Kepikawa is, so, yeah, quite, quite happy to have him. And I've only signed him on a short loan, purely because, given that, Aguirre's only out for three months, we only need somebody to replace him for that sort short period of time until the end of the season or whenever um, he comes back. And we have had another injury as well, Loftus-Cheek. As soon as Asensio came back from injury, Loftus-Cheek got injured and he's now out for I think three months as well. So I think he's approaching the end of his, his injury, I think he's starting his recovery back to uh, first team, so I, think, I don't think it'll be long before he's back. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much all that's happened to Scott. We've not really done anything. Um, yeah, uh, we don't really need to do anything, to be honest. We've got, we've got such a good squad, we, we really don't need to do anything to it. Um, it is literally just a case of filling the gaps when somebody gets injured. Um, I think, yeah, I'll have a look at my how long it's going to be until these guys are back. So, Loftus-Cheek's still got a month, both of them broken ankles, yeah, a month, and uh, Aguri's going to be... Uh, two months effectively, so yeah, it's it's kind of a bit annoying, a bit annoying to lose our number one left back, but um, I think we have found a pretty decent replacement in that whatever his name was lad that we found. So yeah, quite happy with that. Um, I'm not sure there's much else to talk about before we go through the uh, the transfer last few hours of transfer window. As for the table, we're sitting top by. Four points over Crystal Palace, so we're we're looking pretty decent. I don't know Crystal Palace every season. Crystal Palace and Southampton as well somehow somehow make it to the top of the table. I wonder if it'll happen again where Southampton will drop down and end up finishing mid table anyway. But last season was the same. I think the season before that was the same as well. Southampton somehow the first half of the season they finish they they get all the way up top top five top four. And then by the end of the season, they're they're lucky if they're top half of the table. So we'll see if they uh, if they actually manage to hold on to a European place this season. Crystal Palace do perform quite well and do keep it going. They they kind of fade away towards the end of the season, but um, they do stay around that top sort of five or six. Try usually make it into the uh, European places. Which I played Crystal Palace not that long ago, and their squad's not even that great to be honest. It's it's kind of. They've not really added much to it since the start of the game, really, since I started this career mode. So they've got a few players come through, but I think they've all just all the players they've got. I don't know if Crystal Palace, if their base squad's just really got a lot of potential in it, and they just don't sell anybody. So then after a few seasons, that potential starts to come through and they actually start to perform really well. So maybe that's the case. I don't know. I don't know Crystal Palace's squad that deeply, so it could be, but I'm not really sure. I think I think the main problem is just everybody else seems to underperform. Man United are the only team that are, seem to be performing anywhere near well this season, given that they're sitting third, only seven points behind us. I say only seven points. Um, they are still there, capable of catching us. But as for like Spurs, Arsenal sitting seventh and eighth, uh, City are eleventh, Chelsea twelfth again. A Chelsea like given that Chelsea seem to in the second half of the season really kind of kick on and somehow always still finish top four. Um, we'll see if that happens again this season, but it's uh, yeah, it's really odd that the first half of the season, all these teams really underperform, and then it's the second half of the season they actually start to turn up and uh, somehow manage to pull themselves right back up to the top. Liverpool sitting 14. Um, Derby, as predicted in last week's video, still sitting bottom, only managed to win one game from a possible 22, drawn 8, and lost 13. I mean, they're drawn... Like, the only reason they're still even remotely close to the teams above them is the number of games they've drawn. Middlesbrough only drawn two, but they've won five. Derby drawn eight, but only won one. So, um, 
Yeah, not... <laughs> yeah, they're gone. They're down. Absolutely gone. There's no way they're going to catch. Middlesbrough are still in contention to catch them, so Burnmouth. Anyone from, I would say, West Brom down are still possible relegation contenders. I think Liverpool will stay up. I don't think they'll they'll be any risk of them getting knocked down. Um, Newcastle as well will probably be able to stay up. I don't think they'll get caught from their nine point gap down to well, even more than that. Is it twelve points back to Burnmouth? So yeah, I don't think they'll get caught anytime soon. So it's basically West Brom, Sunderland, Watford, Burnmouth, and Middlesbrough battling it out to see who can stay up. Um, yeah, that's basically been the league. Um, as for the cups, we are still in them, which is better than last season. We uh, we were already at this point last season knocked out of the EFL Cup. We are still in that, and we are still in the FA Cup as well. Um, EFL Cup, we just uh, absolutely trounced Newcastle 6 0 over two legs. So we're now into the final against Southampton, who beat uh, Rochdale. Rochdale again getting all the way through to the semi finals. Like, somehow Rochdale seemed to do really well in the cup competitions. Again, Fleetwood as well. Actually, that was there last week. But that's where I'm remembering it from. But, um,. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Rochdale do really well usually every season. They somehow manage to get all the way through the tournaments. Cup competitions get pretty far on. Don't get, never seem to get to the final, but they do get quite far. And I think that's probably the furthest they've been, all the way through to the semi-final. I mean, they haven't had the hardest of competitions up against Fleetwood Town and Crystal uh, Queens Park Rangers. So, yeah, not the hardest of uh, opposition. They then obviously encountered Southampton, who, as for the Premier League, are going. Pretty well, like they're 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 a top top five contending team, and uh, Rochdale managed to score two goals against them, so fair fair game. Um, yeah, so we've we've had a bit of a hard hard run in times. We beat Arsenal, and then we beat uh, Tottenham one nil, so it was a pretty close game, and then obviously beat Newcastle pretty convincingly to make it to, this, to the final. Hopefully, we can beat Southampton. That should probably be in about. What, like three weeks, four weeks time? Mid mid February, end of February, something like that, I think, is the EFL Cup final, maybe, possibly. Perhaps we'll uh, hopefully we'll we'll uh, we'll win that and we'll uh, get ourselves the first silverware of the year. Pro hopefully the first of many pieces of silverware. Um Champions League, as you can see, groups uh, group stages have concluded and we have got through to the uh, the round of 16 yet to be played. We are currently we're, we've been drawn against Wolfsburg, so I, I I I reckon we've got good chance of beating Wolfsburg. Um, yeah, I, I that's that's probably the best team we could have been drawn to be honest. PSV maybe, uh, Sporting possibly would have been maybe a better one, but yeah, that's probably one of the easier teams we could have drawn. At least we're not drawing a a, a PSG, Barcelona, Monaco, Bayern. Real Madrid, Chelsea. Actually, this is probably the strongest the Champions League of Champions, sorry, Champions Cup has been in a long time. Some of the the competition recently has been pretty average, like teams getting knocked out in the group stages, left, right, and center. And uh, by the time you get to the uh, the round of 16, there's there's only one or two big teams left in it. But um, yeah, a very strong looking competition this season. Some tasty looking draws. I think the uh, the Barca Monaco and the uh, Tottenham Paris game would be. Very entertaining. So uh, yeah, that's the uh, the Champions Cup, and uh, have a quick look at the Europa League. Uh, actually, we won't be able to see Europa League because there'll be round of 16, which won't have played yet. Sorry, round of 32, which won't have played yet. So no idea what that looks like. And um, we'll have to wait until the end of the season till we see what's going on there. But yeah, that's pretty much everything that's going that's uh, that's happened. Um, actually, one more thing that has happened. <laughs> uh, just remembered. I was flicking through all the uh, the completed deals, and something that kind of popped up: Tottenham have signed Jan Oblak on a pre-contract. Now, Tottenham have already signed David de Gea last season on a pre-contract, and they managed to get uh, David de Gea, who's now 31, I think. Um, they managed to sign him, who's 92 rated, and now as a backup. They have signed Jan Oblak from Atletico Madrid on a pre-contract, so he'll be joining in the summer, who is, I believe, 91 rated. So they have a 92 and a 91 rated uh, goalkeeper um, just casually hanging out. They've also still got Lloris. I checked that out as well. They've still got Lloris. 
Um, so they have some absolutely ridiculous goalkeeping options. De Gea only has six months left on his contract, so it is possible that they might let that run out or somebody else might go in and get him on a pre-contract. I'm not sure whether that will happen or not. I considered it. His wages aren't massive. They're only 190 grand a week, which is kind of surprising. Um, but given that we've already got a nine, well, 89 going on 90 rated um, Donnarumma, we don't need a David De Gea. In a, in a season, he would Donnarumma would be better than David De Gea. He's only 22, maybe 23 now, Donnarumma. So, like, we really don't need another goalkeeper, especially one of the, the quality of David De Gea. It's, it's just, it would just be complete overkill, really. We don't, we just don't need to spend the money. Also, I don't think I have the money to spend. If I did, I would, and I didn't have Donnarumma, if we still had Cardinal or something like that, I would probably do it. Um, if we had the money, but I, I just don't see the point with Donnarumma on the bench, uh, like in the squad, so it's it's kind of redundant. Anyway, enough chatting. Let's get to transfer deadline day and see if anything outrageous happens. I mean, I think most of the outrageous deals have already been done over here, but we'll have a a quick look through and see if anything does happen in the last few hours of uh, of transfer deadline day. All right, so uh, Sebastian Diriusi. Um, has uh, has signed for Atletico for 29 million from River Plate, which um, I think we're what like six years into this con this this now, so he's probably in his late twenties. I'd imagine maybe 26, 27. Um, yeah, like that's a interesting deal. In reality, he's actually playing for Zenit now, so um, bit of an interesting one. He's still at River Plate after six years. Um, Atletico have now picked him up 29 million. Not really sure what his, what his potential is, what his rating might be at this stage. Um, I could go and check, actually. All right, I'll go and check. He's only 25. He's only 25. He's 84 rated, 25 at the moment. So, uh, yeah. I mean, they have paid pretty much what his valuation is. So, they've got him for a pretty decent price, I'd imagine. Um, yeah, that is that's a, that's a decent, decent purchase. I'm not sure what his potential will be. Um, Still got plenty of years left in him, so he should probably get a bit better. Pretty decent signing. Um, yeah, that's all I've got to say about that, really. So we'll uh, continue on and see if anything else happens. We have got a, I've got an email. Somebody is trying to sign somebody. Uh, who want, They want Donnarumma. Who is it? Tottenham for... No. No, I'm not going to... Why? <laughs> Tottenham want to sign Donnarumma. That is worse than Man United. Like, if they were, if I was to have accepted that, Donnarumma, the Tottenham, at the, by next season would have had Larice, Donnarumma, Jan Oblak, and David de Gea. Like, talk about cornering the market. Like, oh, we'll just sign all the goalkeepers, then nobody else can have a good goalkeeper. Like, that is just outrageous. Given that they got two of them on a free as well, is just. I mean, it is an absolutely kick in the nuts kind of offer as well. He's rated, he's valued between 60 and 71 million, and they're offering 49 and a half million. So, I mean, they're not even close to what he's worth. Like, absolutely nowhere near what they would have to pay to get him. So, we're just, I'm, I'm not interested in selling him. He's 89 rated. Like, I'm not getting rid of him. Um, so, yeah, uh, they can clear off royally. Yeah, that's the end of transfer deadline day. 132 and 300,025. That was a really weird way of saying that. Um, pounds. Uh, that, right, 132 million <laughs> has been spent in transfer deadline day. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a decent deal. Like a decent... Uh, oh, for goodness sake. At least it's only seven days. How do you hyperextend your knee and only be out for seven days? Anyway, that's... I'm not going to complain that it's only seven days. I mean, it happens every single transfer day, like deadline day. You finish transfer deadline day, it's like, oh, by the way, one of your best players, injured! Just every single transfer window. It is just so bad, but I'm not going to not gonna complain about seven days. It could be a hell of a lot worse. Um, Mil Milan Kosic wants to leave. I like how he waits until just after transfer deadline day is completed and is like, by the way, Gaffer, if you could just uh, sell me, that would be great. Um, well, I might sell him. He's not, like, setting the world on fire. He's a good, like, second choice, but he's uh, he's not going to 
become a first choice centre back or right back anytime soon. So maybe, possibly, in the uh, it's on the books. But again, I don't think that career mode is going to go far enough because we've got I think a week and a half, two weeks possibly. When does FIFA 18 come out? The 29th of September. Yeah. So uh, a week and a half from the point of this video going out. So I think uh, next week's video, next Monday, will be the last of this season's career mode. Um, it will be the end of the Markham career. So hopefully we complete an absolutely outrageous quadruple and win everything. <laughs> um, I, main, main focus this season is to win the Champions League. So hopefully we win the Champions League. Um, that would round it off really nicely. Six seasons, we're into 2022 now. Um, and if Markham could win the Champions League. And then we'll start afresh with a new team in FIFA 18. Um, not sure who I'm going to play as yet, but um, yeah, next week will be the finale of this transfer, of this uh, career mode. And uh, yeah, it's been a good one. It's been a good one. It's been uh, some ups and downs, but ultimately, in the last few seasons, quite a lot of ups. So yeah, pretty good. Um, in fact, it's been a lot of ups, really. Um, not that many downs at all, really, apart from injuries. But anyway, that's enough chatting and gabbing on about everything. That has concluded the uh, the January transfer window. And uh, yeah, if you've enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe as well if you're new around here. And I'll catch you guys next week. So until then, cheerio.